really excited to talk to you today about how Industry 4.0 principles will help drive the adoption of advanced cell therapies. Our panelists have a breadth of expertise across cell and gene therapy, design, development, manufacturing, commercialization. Uh, so we're going to tap into their expertise mostly. I will not talk much. I will ask a few questions and let the panelists uh, speak on their behalf. So today we're tackling the question whether advanced therapies are emerging as a consequence of uh, Industry 4.0 capabilities or if it was just a natural progression of the biologics industry. So there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, I'll explain that a little bit further. We will give an overview, a definition of Industry 4.0 in extremely summary fashion. We don't have time to go into all the depth of what Industry 4.0 is and the nuance there, so, but we will cover it. One housekeeping item for questions. We'd like this to be highly participatory. If you have a question, please raise your hand and somebody will throw a cube at you, which is actually like at a concert, uh, grab it and speak into one side of it, and uh, hopefully everybody will be able to hear you. If it does not work for whatever reason, um, I will repeat the answer or repeat the question to make sure that everybody in the audience gets to hear it. To make the best use of our hour, um, we've divided this section into, or this session into three topic areas. The first is going to be framing. We're going to sort of define Industry 4.0, what it means to us, and um, you know, kind of what are some of the differentials between biologics, development, commercialization. In the second one is where we'll spend the bulk of our time. So we want to talk a little bit about um, in each of the kind of uh, advanced therapy spaces of design of therapy manufacturing of therapy, and then managing all the logistical complexity of advanced therapy manufacturing. We'll try to go through each one of those, identify which of the Industry 4.0 concepts are most material to that topic, and then have a discussion around that with a few questions. I do encourage all the panelists to redirect questions to each other or say, hey, my idea is better. I'm going to talk on top of you now, uh, just to keep it fun and entertaining. Um, Finally, at the last part, we'll ask each of the speakers to give a little forward-looking statement if they're comfortable with, and just say, where, do we, where are we going to be in 15 or 20 years? So that's the agenda for today. Looking forward to that. Enough from me. I'm going to ask each of the speakers to um, quickly give an introduction, and then we'll jump off from there. Andy. Hi. Uh, can you hear me OK? Can you, no? Mike, just, please? Yeah. Bikes. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> Now you can hear me. Uh, Andy Lin, I'm from Genentech. I've been there for about 12 years, uh, primarily in the large molecule area, um, and launched a couple products there, uh, enemies. I've uh, been in my current role, leading the cell therapy program um, for the last six months. Um, but prior to Genentech, I was working at a company called Cell Genesis, which did a lot of the early work for cell and gene therapy. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Great. Right, Damien. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Hello. Yep. So, I'm, I'm Damien Marshall. I'm the VP for Analytical Development at Resolution Therapeutics, which is uh, a UK company that are developing uh, engineered macrophage therapies for liver disease. Um, I've been with Resolution for six weeks, so I'm relatively new there. But um, my background is all around um, is all around <coughs> analytical development. So prior to Resolution, I was at Achilles Therapeutics, helping develop TIL therapies for lung cancer, and then. Prior to that, I spent eight years at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult in the UK, where uh, I set up and led their analytical innovations team. Great. Is, uh, can everybody hear me? <laughs> Always. <laughs> Waiting for the, there we go. So my name is Michael May. I'm the uh, CEO of the CCRM, which is a, an accelerator. It's, a, it's really a company creator that combines company creation and technology development uh, with manufacturing support and manufacturing capability and also uh, strategic investment. Um, and with respect to the manufacturing capability, I mean, we do have uh, a team in partnership with Cytiva that works on technology development, strategic technology development, uh, which applies here. When, when I think of in Industry 4.0, I think of connectivity. So what CCRM is doing is trying to connect not just in, within manufacturing, but uh, therapeutic development, with investability, with supply chain, with business models, adoption and reimbursement. So kind of think of it broadly like that. And just, just you know, uh, Industry 4.0 really builds on artificial intelligence. And so as a commercialization 
person. I, I think of computers uh, as having enabled or, uh, or having lowered the cost of arithmetic. And AI, and AI is, is lowering the cost of prediction. So when you think of Industry 4.0, for me, it's all about connectivity and prediction. All right, I'm going to so, write that down. We'll come back to that for yeah. sure. <laughs> Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Moore. I'm the Chief Technical <clears throat> Officer at Allergen Therapeutics. Allergen is an allergenic CAR-T development company. <clears throat> Prior to being at Allergene, I was uh, at Amgen for 20 years. Great, thanks. So, as I promised, for those keeping score in the room, uh, the first section we'll talk a little bit about is framing. Just a few minutes to kind of set the uh, set the context of. Uh, uh, Michael gave a little bit of his perspective on what Industry 4.0 looks like, but we'll go a little bit deeper and define it. So, for those of you not familiar with the concept, if you think back about the inflection points of humans harnessing uh, new technologies <coughs> and, and kind of these moments of inflection of, of progress, technically uh, and scientifically, uh, that you know we look back. I can think the first industrial revolution was really built around uh, water and steam power, the second industrial revolution around gas, power, and electricity. Uh, the third industrial revolution is broadly thought of as the computational developments of the mid 20th century. In Industry 4.0, which is often about automation and machines, uh, can, what was it, Michael? Connectivity and, uh, and prediction. Predic there prediction, we go. Yeah. So I'll, I'll loop that in there. But off, the Industry 4.0 is often <clears throat> characterized by items and ideas. So these are the things we'll be exploring, things such as big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, the internet of things, process analytic technologies, and automation. So those are very often the buzzwords of <coughs> Industry 4.0. Um, so what we want to explore a little bit first is, are they just buzzwords, or how are they actually um, helping to materialize advanced therapies, whether it's in manufacturing, design, or ultimately sort of connecting patients with these therapies? So the first question I have is basically, which came first? Is, uh, is, was advan was, were any of these capabilities sort of requisite for advanced therapies to materialize, whether it's on the scientific side? Or is it, are we just on this continual progression from biologics and the next obvious biologic was put something else into a cell or modify a cell in another way? So Andy, I'll start with your th you and your thoughts. Yeah, so maybe from our experience at Genentech, right, it's looking at uh, sort of neoantigen prediction for, <coughs> for TCR recovery. I mean, just use that as an example, right, where the computational power in next-gen sequencing technology generating mountains of data. We have partners with BioNTech, NICODE, uh, internal, internally as well. So we see a lot of data just pouring out <coughs> all these new, you know, new methodologies and how are we going to use that. Um, and that's where I, I kind of see the, a lot of the bioinformatic data that's coming our way and how can we leverage that and learn from that, right? How, how can you take, for example, right, this applies to lots of things. How do you take the millions of neoantigens and predict what a T cell receptor might look like, right? And how do you, how do you power that into a production environment? That, that's like a huge challenge that we've been working with our partner uh, and internally too. So to, to question, maybe it's a little bit of both. It's like the continuing, improvement in next-gen sequencing and also bioinformatic workflow, the power of the internet, right? Everything, a lot of these things are down the cloud these days. Um, and so how, how do you then marry that to product design, right? But, yeah. Yeah. So Damien, on the sort of that extension of that theme, analytical technologies that were probably invented 20 years ago for biologics characterization slowly started to build up data repositories that could be mineable. And, you know, do you have any thoughts on extending what, what Andy just said in terms of how did we get the data? Yeah, and so I think biologics has been, has been a help in some instances. I think when you're looking at um, areas like viral vector manufacture, there's been some natural crossover between the types of technologies that have been used for, for supporting biologics and then the natural <coughs> progression into viral vector is, is slightly different. I mean, the scalability are different between, between the two. You know, I don't know of any viral vectors that have gone much <coughs> beyond several hundred liters. They're certainly not going into the, uh, into the thousands of liters. 
And then when you look at the, the technologies around um, improving the producer cell lines, they're starting to come over now. You know, I mean, you know, if you look at biologics, they're, they're looking at about um, 100 pounds a litre for manufacturing and manufacturing quantities of 10 grams per litre. And that's been done over 20 years where they've been refining the ways that they've been developing their producer cell lines and then in integrating those into their processes. And that's starting to come. Into, into viral vector manufacture, but now we're seeing the gene editing technologies and the ability to do this in a, in a, you know, people think about gene editing and think about, you know, you target specific genes in there and then you look at the effect, but, you know, the, the gene editing, te editing technologies are so powerful now that you can just unscreen, you can just do a completely uncontrolled screen where you randomly knock out single or multiple genes, you see what is working. And then you go back and you sequence and you find out what you've actually knocked out and you actually then can start to develop lines much quicker than this um, empirical way of, way of going about it that takes decades. So I think the transition is there and I think it's really helped in terms of viral vector manufacturing. I think we're going to see the benefits of that <coughs> going forward. But in other areas, it, it, it's not been the case. You know, with, um, with resolution therapeutics as an example, you know, we are, we're an autologous uh, therapy developer in the first instance. We are moving towards allogeneic, but... The, the spillover from biologics is, is much less because our manufacturing process is, is very different. It's, in some ways, it's more complex than, uh, than, than biologics manufacturing. And so what we can take from that is, is, is very different. And you know, what we are looking at is where things like PAT, and I know we're going to come on to PAT a little bit um, in, in this discussion, but we are looking at where the learnings from, from, from biologics manufacturing could potentially influence the things that we do um, in, the, in the future. Or train us badly to do things. <laughs> but or, we'll come or, back to that. Or train us badly, yeah. 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 No, thanks. So, so producer lines as kind of an exemplar of first early baby steps of engineering and designing um, cell lines for this higher productivity. Michael, you talk about connectivity and prediction. Yeah. I told you I was going to say that. So <laughs> in, in terms of kind of this evolution from biologic, I mean, is, is it just that we have so much more data available to us to mine and curate and explore that we're just getting faster at what we're doing or better? Or how do you think about yeah, this so, next generation? You've started a few companies now. Yeah, so. but I, I, would, I would say that maybe I'll be contrarian a little bit and say that I think the industry is still mostly in industry 3.0, mm -hmm. which is focused on computation, automation, robotics. I mean, we're still working a lot on that. And an outcome of you know, all that, you know, having computational uh, power is generating data. So just having the data yeah. and measuring lots of data doesn't necessarily take you to the connectivity or the predictive capacity of Industry 4.0, right. which I, and I think that, you know, we're still, we're still working on kind of individual unit operations. We're still yep. Yep. trying to connect. We're still trying to understand. And when you, when you think of Industry 4.0 in a way that we can all understand, you know, your thermostat at home is connected to your TV, which is connected to your garage door opener. And, but the thing is, like, we know what a stove does. We know what a thermostat does in your furnace. We can understand that. You know, I think that Industry 4.0 will set a context mm -hmm. for the development of advanced therapies. Um, so it'll be different than in the past. But I still think we're evolving to have the capacity to do it. And a great, a great example is engineering cells. I mean, yep. engineering means that you're engineering in, you know, ability to measure, measuring a specific thing and being able to control. So I think it's, it's there. So the cost, we're still of, stuck in the cost of computation in Industry 3.0 thing has come down dramatically, our ability to store large amounts of data, but we're still not necessarily that's a capacity, translating it. That's we a capacity, capacity issue, not necessarily a what you do with the data. We, we don't have the knowledge coming out of yeah. the data yet. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah, I, I think so, but it'll happen. Allison, what are you doing? Yeah, I agree. To your initial question, um, at least in the T cell space, I feel absolutely the advanced cells uh, came first. Um, I think the autologous T cell therapy is derived from transplant biology. You know, it didn't come because we were able to take on industry 4.0 concepts. I think those get layered on top of some fundamental biology, but I absolutely agree um, in the engineering of um, allogeneic cells of all kinds, in, in my case, uh, CAR T cells, 
um, using um, CRISPR or Italian nucleases certainly requires computational power and design that we didn't have the ability to do a little while back. Is that technically an aspect of Industry 4.0? I, uh, I mean, it comes under the definition. Um, yeah, because ultimately what we're trying to unpack, will this industry continue to progress if, let's say, <coughs> Industry 4.0 ideas or the, or the concepts that have been highlighted or showcased disappeared, where would we be stuck? Would we go any further than we are today or um, we'll, we'll evolve from, we'll continue to evolve from here? Let's move on from the framing section and go a little bit deeper onto three categories. So the therapy development. So in, for these next couple of questions, let's just think about the design of the therapy or ancillary materials around the therapy. Before we go, we'll, we'll get to manufacturing. I think a lot of people conflate uh, Industry 4.0 automation connectivity with manufacturing. But let's start just on the therapy design. A um, couple of my questions there would be, what of the industry 4.0 concepts that were articulated here do you think are most important and most valuable as applied to a therapy design? And I'll start with you this time, Allison. Well, the, the term <coughs> design is like a beautiful term <laughs> in biology, but because of the some of the things that my colleagues have already mentioned, our ability to design is a little spotty. It's not holistic. So I would love to start with the, the, the true design of a therapeutic concept for a cell therapy. Um, we, we, we don't, we don't, there's too many gaps in our biology to do that. But um, referring back to my prior point, we can certainly design um, an editing uh, construct, or um, we can design on paper um, a molecular basis for um, a therapeutic that we think uh, will be um, potent and active um, with respect to whatever disease we're trying to um, um, tackle. Uh, however, to, to me, product design requires much more knowledge of critical quality attributes than we currently have in the cell therapy space. Yeah. So I think, that, um, I think that therapeutic developers in the cell therapy space are trying every day to design. Um, and I think that the force of those attempts over time are going to create change and improvement. Um, at, at the moment though, um, you know, our ability to really design a live cellular therapeutic mm -hmm. is marginal. I, no, I love that framing because it, we talk quite a bit about you know the patient specificity of a lot of these advanced therapies, the living quality, right? It's a the product is highly variable, it's highly regulated, um, and, and then obviously it's highly personalized. And Andy, I know at Genentech you're sort of uh, not you discuss the neoantigen approach, and that is kind of the. The, the final frontier of complexity, if you will, right? It's patient specific plus it's tumor specific uh, specificity. So, you know, would you guys have been stuck had you not had all these new computational tools that have borrowed from the past? Yeah, I mean, the computational tools are, um, are actually kind of new, I would say. You know, it's a growing area for us. We, we had a sort of in-source knowledge, right, either through partnership or hire the right people. And actually, we have a pretty large bioinformatics team at Genentech. And the key thing in terms of product design, right, is really starting with your therapeutic product profile, right, your TPP, and how do you take your CQAs and all the way link it to the clinical outcome, right? For cells, it could be persistence, activity, safety. If you're working on gene editing, whether the persistence of the edited cells or off-targeting, and how do you connect that, right, <clears throat> from your very beginning biology design to your CQA testing, extended characterization to outcome, right, meaning are we working with our clinical folks and PKPD folks, you know, bioinformatics folks to connect that whole thing together. So that's been a journey for us. Uh, we're still learning. Um, but all, a lot of times we don't have very good animal models, right, for what we have. So we have to rely on um, sometimes not very large clinical studies, right? I mean, Kite launched their product with less than 100 patients. 
can you really understand a lot from that? Probably not yet. So the, the key, I think, one of our, our thing, key things is just make sure the data is not silo um, in each area. Us being a pretty large company, we tend to do that. <clears throat> um, but even smaller companies, right, data can be siloed, right, and making those connectivity um, is going to be part of the 4.0 concept here, right? And so, yeah. Michael, you, again, I'm going to pick on you on, on this idea because we talked quite a bit about the breadth and the wealth of data that are available to us, but it's really, unless you deliberately curate that against outcomes and meaning, you, you don't have the learning sets or the teaching sets. You want to talk a little bit about what you're doing at CCRM and some of the thinking that you've put behind that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that, I mean, there's a lot of data being collected it's, um, and a lot of data generated. But I think it's about, you know, engineering in the, you know, the right data and, and curating it. Sometimes we're not collecting enough data to enable AI. And I'll be very clear, at CCRM, we're not doing artificial intelligence. You know, teaching systems with loads of data is, is not there yet. And I think, I think we sometimes confuse what engineers have been doing for many years is modeling, you know, doing systems modeling or understanding systems. And we, you know, we're looking at them, you know, either, you know, linearly or non-linearly. But these are, these are, this is about modeling systems. And I think that there's still a lot of you know, extraction of those capabilities from the biologics industry, you know, process engineers are, you know, we need more of them to, to, to capture that capability within, uh, within the modeling. But, um, you know, going that next level to prediction is, you know, again, it's not there yet. We're doing some good standard engineering, um, but the data, you know, the data that's being collected is, I don't think, sufficient mm -hmm. for artificial intelligence. I think it's a buzzword right now. It's one that's going to set the context in the future. Um, but the ability to actually engineer cells for therapeutic, you know, for function, for manufacturability, to track them, to enable biosensing, I mean, these are all fundamental enablers of Industry 4.0. Yeah. So that, it's, that's an incredible tool to design in the system to enable for yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we're, that's the kind of stuff we're thinking, and thinking about. And with the complexity CCRM. of biological systems, I, I spent you know, <clears throat> confession here, I'm an ex-GE person, but you know, the, 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 uh, the aviation branch used to talk about, just throw sensors on it. We don't care what it measures. Just measure everything. <laughs> we'll sort it out later. Right. And that makes sense kind of in these Newtonian systems where you, 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 know, you can start to think about failure modes, and you really are building these just enormous data sets. In biology, it's the curation part and, and getting to that uh, sort of, if you can't, if you, you can measure a ton of things, but you can't extract meaning from it. So with that in mind, I mean, like you're, you come from a strong process analytics background and sort of building, designing technologies into processes. Is, is that just a bridge too far to sort mm -hmm. of take that aviation model and apply it to biology? Um, it, I, I guess it depends on the types of technologies you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to use. I mean, you know, if you look at if you look at biologics just as an example, then you know they typically went with infrared spectroscopy for a, for a long, long time, built up huge data sets with technologies like that, and then we started to see them transition over to slightly more advanced techniques like Raman spectroscopy now, and it's it's it's, it's quite interesting to see how that's evolved because. Pre-pandemic, I mean, literally, literally just before the pandemic hit, and I was in a meeting in, in Japan, and, and Janssen were talking about the fact that they just validated Raman spectroscopy for use in their biologics manufacturing process, and that was the first example I'd seen of that because the validation within GMP was always the challenge for it, and they managed to do that because they had they could use the <coughs> near infrared as an orthogonal validation tool. Now you fast forward to 2022, and you know, I was at a bioprocessing meeting earlier this year. And there was maybe 15 presentations that are talking about the implementation of Raman for biologics. So you, you suddenly see a big shift in doing that. Now, can we use that for cell and gene therapy? Um, we don't have the orthogonal methods to cross-validate against, and so it would be really challenging to, you could gather the data, but could you use it for controlling a process? Probably not at the minute, because validating that within a GMP would be a significant undertaking. 
could you use that outside of viral vector manufacturing? You know, and certainly in the autologous space, then you know, my, my feeling is no, it's just too expensive. You know, if you're looking at £250,000 for a, for a Raman sensor, you're not going to embed that into every single autologous manufacturing um, batch that you're doing because it's just going to, you know, the cost, the impact on your cost of goods is going to go through the roof. So you have to be a little bit smarter about what you want to gather in terms of data. And so, you know, the, the approach that, you know, we've seen companies taking now is, is, is taking in process samples and just gathering data through omics based approaches and and in a way it's you know it's an unstructured approach you're just gathering as much data as you as you possibly can you go into your clinical trial you start to look at what your clinical readouts are and then you're coming back into the data to try and see can we see some correlations between you know what we're measuring within our process here and what's actually gone on and happened uh, within the clinic and I think that's going to be the process that we that we see happening at least in the in the first instance particularly for particularly in the autonomous space. Yeah, well, but no, I mean, Phil, I think it does, but I, I think it does um, speak to the, the need to continue to develop analytics capabilities within the sector. I mean, yeah. you know, identity, purity, potency are still yeah. challenges. <clears throat> and then what, but when you start to, you know, take it to the next level and build, you know, a breadth and depth of tools, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think that's still a major gap in the yeah. industry. It's and no, I, it's I want to come to that. I, I, okay, I just sorry. want to finish up one last thing on this design because this is yeah. the bridge to this discussion, okay. I think. Um, Andy and Allison, you both mentioned CTQs and design, like when we're thinking about a design of a therapeutic approach or a modality, obviously everything is, quality is paramount, but potency. Can we talk a little bit about sort of engineering and designing potency? Because that's going to have a huge implication on manufacturing in terms of the scale that we operate on. Do you have any thoughts on how much of our effort in this industry 4.0 world is being sort of promoted against building higher potency or improving Manufacturability versus manu improving patient outcomes. Maybe that's the same thing. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. That was a very complicated question. <laughs> I think that um, okay. So I'll try and um, I, I have a thought. Um, I I'll pick up on something that um, Michael was saying um, about predictive. Capability. So if, if I think about um, um, as a cell biologist, the CHO cell work that I did previously, so, you know, CHO cells, renewable cell source, um, I mean, ultimately they do potentially show some um, kind of deterioration, but let, let's just assume that they're, you know, completely renewable. So the observations and collection of data, the reproducibility, from a um, immortalized cell line um, uh, lends itself to collection of information and therefore the creation of models and, and um, getting to predictive capability that's been mentioned. From a cell biologist's perspective, um, a T cell production culture is like an enormous primary culture. And you're not starting with the same starting material every time either. You, in the autologous space, you're starting with the patient starting material. In the allogeneic <coughs> space, you're starting with individual donor material. So your starting material is different, and the progression of your culture um, may be different. I mean, we, w we try for it to be consistent, but um, and you're differentiating all the way through the, the process. So I think that um, that doesn't lend itself as easily um, to, um, as Damien was saying, like collecting these, uh, I mean, we, we'll do it over time, but um, at the moment there's a bit of brute force uh, required. And then to your question about potency, like designing potency, um, I think that Again, where we can attempt to design potency is through our molecular construct. So at Allogene, um, we specifically designed in um, an integrated, um, uh, constitutively active cytokine in the interests of improved um, potency. Does that translate into an improved patient outcome? I mean, that, that is to be determined. 
that, that's the idea. <laughs> um, but um, we, we don't have, I think, in the field sufficient knowledge um, to be able to categorically say, I will design this. I think that will come in the future. I, th I think it will be a little more plug and play with our molecular constructs. Um, and uh, some of the CAR constructs, actually, the chimeric antigen receptor constructs, um, are, are getting <coughs> that way, that they're becoming so well understood. Um, the capability and potency of those car constructs um, are, are highly used across the industry and we're collecting a huge data set associated with those. But then accessory molecular manipulations and edits are much less characterized and, and we don't have the predictive capability yet of determining potency as a result of those measures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so maybe a little bit on potency, right? We um, typically what we see is, um, you know, very little potency on the control system in the beginning uh, from companies that we work with, and and so that's you know like T cell, right? Everybody does gamma interferon secretion, right? But what other things are going on with the cells? What other methods are we doing as characterization to supplement that interferon gamma interferon release? Just take that as an example. So these other characterization assays and our ability to, to measure them and track them during clinical <clears throat> progression, I think it's key, right? And that's, that's probably, it, and that, that's, that's a struggle for everybody, right, in the room here. Uh, the other CQA that I see is probably the starting materials, right? Even either the autologous starting material, are we characterizing them? How about some of the, for example, gene editing material, Cas9, guide RNA, template DNA, whatever, right, bio vectors, are we characterizing those? And the agency is actually looking for more and more characterization and controls around that. So as an industry, that's something I encourage us all to kind of take a deeper dive into uh, qualifying and really understanding the, CQ, the key material attributes on some of those products. So not, let's not forget, you know, the starting material is probably where we're getting most of our variabilities in, in, in this type of products. So. Yeah, so coming back to, uh, Michael, did you want to say no, something? No, you know, in engineering, engineering cells in the therapeutic space is going beyond, you know, maybe pure potency, but around, you know, engineering cells to be cloaked from the immune system or putting fail-safe switches in them, which will require, you know, monitoring data and, predict, and prediction in order to, to, you know, trigger those elements of future cell therapy as well. Yeah. So, Allison, you had commented about how easy CHO manufacturing is, right? No. <laughs> Comparatively. But uh, more seriously, the, one of the things that we talk about, we'll shift now to manufacturing a little bit and start to go deeper there. Um, people talk about the process being the product that we are still defined by a number of unit operations that we stitch together. We're highly dependent on technologies and equipment that came before, right? And that we're slowly starting to see the emergence of new production equipment and data <clears throat> management uh, capabilities for, um, for, for production. With the premise of you can't manage what you can't measure, um, you want to talk a little bit about some of the manufacturing challenges and what you each are doing to go and to transition from the product, the process being the product, or the, and then the product to make it the product is the product. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to start on that. Um, so, I mean, when we're thinking about automation, you know, with a lot of a lot of the time when we're thinking about this, it's looking at how we're gonna we're gonna you know increase our scalability, reduce our cost of goods, reduce our product cycle times, make these therapies you know cheaper for for the for the patients and the and the healthcare providers, and they're all they're all you know very, really great you know, aspirational aims. But you know, when you actually look at where we are as a field, where we're some way off. Hitting our hitting what we want to where we want to be and you know to give you an example I was trying to think about how you could really frame this but you know if 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 you if you held out your hand and I put a gram of aspirin in your hand then that's a chemical synthesis process super high throughput highly efficient the value of that is probably about twenty cents you know if if you then replace that with um, a, a biologic drug like Elaprase you know it, again it's a high throughput process it's a much more complex therapy. That has a value of about seven hundred thousand pounds. Now, you take that away and put a gram of zolgensma in your hand, where you've got another big leap in terms of the complexity of the therapy and the manufacturing process 
isn't as efficient as what you've got with biologics, and that has a value of about 300 million pounds. You know, and so that's the difference in terms of you know when we're thinking about how are we going to scale these and how are we going to make these these, these cheaper. <clears throat> there's a long way to go in order in order to achieve that. And I think automation is going to play a key role in helping us achieve that. But you know, it is it is a, a long journey. It's not something that we're we're quite there yet. Yeah, and the, the challenge between autologous therapies and allogeneic <clears throat> therapies. I, I imagine allogeneic therapies were designed to sort of. Uh, Bruce Levine was famous for once saying, you know, how do you dose a living drug? You know, how do you mm -hmm. dose something when it's variable once you administer it to a patient? How does that compare autologous from allogeneic, Allison? I mean, presumably that's one of the motivations. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one batch, one patient is um, economically tough, and um, I think there are some really great automated solutions coming forward. Um, an example would be the Solaris um, options, in, in my opinion. Um, in the allogeneic space, right, our objective is to uh, manufacture hundreds of doses um, per batch. Um, and honestly, at the moment, um, I am not so motivated to think about automating anything. Um, I feel that our individual unit operations, I, I feel that we're still in a very emergent space. Um, I might want to switch up, um, you know, the sequence of those operations. I might want to fundamentally change some of them. I'm definitely not ready to lock in any integrated sequence of automation. Individual unit op steps, um, our, our suppliers are providing nice options for closed and automated um, individual unit ops, but personally, I'm not asking my teams to spend any time whatsoever automating the entire process. I, I, for, for us, that, that's, um, that's, that's not where we need to be um, spending our time and attention. Yeah, Elon Musk is famous for saying, you know, engineers are really, really good at optimizing every step of a process as opposed to stopping and thinking, do we just take one of those steps out of the process? So, you know, Damon, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I was interested to what, in what you just said there about the Solaris system, and it, it feels a little bit like, in terms of automation, we've almost gone full circle because, you know, for those of you who remember back to the, the kind of the late 90s, early noughties, we had the Compact Select system, which was a robotic arm trying to replicate what a human does for cell culture. You know, and when that came out, that seemed like a revolution. Now, obviously, it, that makes the assumption that humans do it right, and that's the most optimal way of doing it, and we learned that that's not the case, and you can actually have technologies that, that do these processes much more efficiently. But now with, with technologies like the Solaris, it's flipped the other way. We're now taking those technologies and putting the robotic arms back in to actually come back and actually do the manufacturing process and take the human back out in that way. And that's, you know, it seems a, it's, it's an interesting that that's actually gone that, that, that full circle. But one of the things that, that I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of and I keep, I keep bringing up is that you know, if you've got a manufacturing facility and you've designed that facility to manufacture 1,000 products a year and then you bring in all of this automation and now you can do 3,000 products a year in that, then what about your QC? You know, if you've got a QC department that can only release a thousand products a year, then your capacity is still only a thousand products a year. So what do you do? Do you exponentially increase your QC and try and get more and more staff into there, which is can you which is a challenge? You but you could automate it. Or, like do, you, prob yeah. or do you automate it? Yeah. But you know, there's very little effort yeah. in terms of automation. Well, there's, there's there's very little effort in terms of automation of QC. Yeah. There are you know there are liquid handling systems, but it's it's not a. It's not really a quantum leap. It's just a. It's just incre slightly increasing the scale, you know. Or do you fundamentally change Q the, the QC procedure and think about you know how do we do this differently? I mean that's a great example of where we've taken something from biologics and and brought it over and said this is the way that we have to release product. But you know maybe there is that a comes way. back to the CTQ. If you if you introduce new changes into your process. You have to make, demonstrate that the product is the same, whether you automate or not. Um, I think that the advantage of some of the automation concepts that are being you know, promoted are really about let's make whatever we do, do it consistently. And then you do that on top of the backdrop of a highly you know, variable biology problem. So, I, th I think that what Damien said is actually 
the key to thinking about the introduction or uh, evolution of automation in advanced therapy space. The best thinking that I've heard about it recently is exactly about trying to automate a lot of the um, uh, quality measurements that are required. Um, for, for us, our uh, testing takes at least 3x the time of production. And um, with advanced <coughs> therapies, the heterogeneity of the type of uh, measurements that we have to make it is, is very broad. Um, and some of the measurements, um, such as um, you know, gene editing fidelity, um, are, you know, they're, they're also um, advancing <coughs> themselves. But the concept that maybe you could um, have almost all of your measurements be um, molecular and sequencing based and therefore you could automate and speed those up, I think, I mean, that's where um, a very significant um, component of costs lie in advanced therapies. And uh, if, if I were interested in sort of an overarching automation paradigm, I would go after testing rather than production. Taking out human error and, and sort of and repetitive data entry types of things. Do you have an idea of the, uh, the cost of testing versus the cost of production, not just the time? Yeah. yeah. Is it, is it <laughs> I was just trying to contest the point. No. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. trying to press yeah, the point. No, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. I yeah maybe agree. I can is interject it, there, yeah. right? I mean, cost of goods and turnaround time are definitely the two society and patient impact, right? Topic that we need to think about as an industry, right? It's about the patients. It's about benefit to society, right? And so. You know, cost of goods, where, where are the big levers, right? It's the raw materials, right, in this area, really expensive. Uh, the turnaround time, obviously, right, from months, right, to maybe <clears throat> days, right? That's key for patients and also cost reduction. Automation, where it helps. I think we have to honestly look at our processes and procedure testing to see where it makes sense to invest, right? That's sort of the, the, so you can do a business analysis almost, right, of your overall process cost, and then selectively pick, pick and choose where you want to focus. So, so I, I think it's, 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 that's at least the approach we've taken, right, is we do a top-down analysis and say, you know, what's the impact on patient, society, cost of goods, then we go from there. I, I think that's an easier way, um, it gives you a, a better North Star, right, in terms of what you're really trying to do. So I, that's highly but, consistent with the sort of the industry one, two, three, four. They had to have mm -hmm. a significant impact on, you know, the human endeavor, human outcome. So. But the, there's also so some embeddedive or repetitive opportunities. So um, I think it's fair to say that for a cell therapy um, that is transduced, one of the uh, biggest factors associated with COGM is um, the cost of the vector. Mm -hmm. But the challenges in making the whole cell product um, and the costs associated with that and what we don't know and why we have to test so much and why that adds to cost yeah. on the cell side, those same challenges exist on the vector side. So um, it's, it, that, that's where um, the cell and gene therapy space working together um, can in, enable us um, hopefully uh, progressively over time to buy down the costs of the incoming and, and uh, you know, so that helps the gene therapy space and then also um, cell therapy space. Yeah, and actually, Mike, I want to ask that as, to you as a question because you talked at the beginning of connectivity and yeah. predictability. It, it, that applies as much to biology as supply chain, right? If you, to you answer your question, if you could predict how much material you needed, when you needed it, if we could add efficiency through these types of tools and tech, that would be a, at least a baby step in the right direction. Yeah, and I, and I think on, you know, from, from the biology perspective, there's probably enough data there for AI to be useful. So AI might actually help autologous therapies 
uh, initially more than allogeneic, where we're imposing our engineering on allogeneic and then trying to, uh, to take advantage of, say, Industry 4.0. But I think just generally in manufacturing, we haven't achieved you know, the, data, the right data collection, but what we really haven't achieved is the right connectivity. Right. Uh, you know, everyone is working on their own unit operations. Um, you know, they're not necessarily compatible. You know, I think of the Cytiva Chronicle system, which is trying to, you know, sit above unit operations and connect them as, so they're kind of working together and then hooking, hooking that kind of a system up to the front end and the back end. Um, uh, so I think in, in terms of manufacturing, we just haven't connected things well enough to actually take advantage of the predictive yeah. capabilities. No, that's a really an interesting point because, it, look, if you've got a very large diversity of technologies out there and then you're talking about putting a layer on top of them to connect them, is that really solving that you can spend years just trying to figure out how to get these things to talk to each other and then you have to sort of audit to make sure that that data trail is com com you know, but, but wouldn't it be better just to have why don't you go back to your office and go sit down and write new write a whole new uh, yeah. manufacturing execution system I've, I've, uh, <laughs> the uh, I, I just I, I think that I just think it's a reflective of us being kind of at industry 3.0 with yeah. respect to this right so you know we've had great advancements in specific unit operations but a lot of those unit operations are being validated with you know different cell times with very you know um, I wouldn't say simplistic but standard outcomes you know they're you know do they work with different cells yeah. you know it's and you know media optimization is still really Rudimentary, rudimentary yeah. but but it's but it's important. So I think that you know there's a lot of excellent work going on in a very diverse system. But I, I think Industry 4.0 won't be enabled until we connect them. It That's just right. won't happen. Right. But is like talk, use that media example, right? Is yeah. it complicated because cells respond differently depending on where they're derived from, what their genetic makeup is? And is, is it really just, it's so complex that we haven't worked out the rules or the formulas to predict what will happen? Because you could do media, fast forward 100 years, right? We have all of the biochemical systems <coughs> mapped out. You should be able to do a media optimization in silica. But we can't because we don't have the information. Yeah, I mean, that's the data curation. Yeah, issue, which right? and and the kind of the. But there's no shortcut from here to there. We're not yeah, going to make yeah. it up. We have to deliver it on the. On I think the you're you're looking at a very bright future. So. <laughs> there we go. Job well, security. Think, somebody said it already. It's about. I mean, what do we measure? If you don't know that you're measuring the right thing, then you can do all the computation you want. You won't yeah. come up with the right answer. And so that's why um, I think Andy was saying about using kind of. That broad scape approaches, <coughs> omics approaches, because people are kind of panning the landscape to try and find what matters. Yeah. And when a we find what matters, then we can do. Yeah, and what a you AI want to will. Do. I'm not an expert in AI, but my understanding is that AI, if you have enough data and you teach it, it will figure out what parameters part, are right? important better than humans yeah. do. And I, th I think the teaching part is important. One of the things that we are missing are, are good scale-down systems to allow mm -hmm. us to generate data. Everything that you need to do is at big scale, which is low throughput and expensive. Mm -hmm. So you, you know that's one of the, the big barriers. Is, is that have. because those systems are not wholly predictive of the larger size, or they're just not available? Both. I think okay. you know. I mean, you know, if you if you, you know if you're looking <coughs> at stir tank bioreactor systems, then there are systems that go down to 15 mils and let you do high throughput. But outside of that, they're, they're, they just don't scale down. And so everything either has to be done in a different format and you, you, you kind of try and interpret the results that you get there in terms of what it might mean when you go to a larger scale, which is, you know, it's not ideal. It's, it carries risks in terms of doing that. Or you try and do optimization and data gathering at scale, which is, which is slow and, and, and expensive. Yeah. Andy, do you have any yeah. follow-up buzz? Okay. <laughs> It might be a good moment to sort of pause and see if there's any burning comments or questions from the audience. I've got two on the three on the front here. I saw your hand first. This is <clears throat> where we get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the good discussion. I'm Karen Walker. Is this on? Yeah, you have to talk okay. pretty close into it. Okay. Because it looks weird too. I'm talking to a blue cube. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so I have a, a general comment and then I would like to hear people's opinions. I mean, I, I 
very much agree with what Allison said. This is a biological system. I, I, don't, I don't believe we understand even enough to think about how we would automate, characterize, or control <coughs> it. And as we get more complex in our uh, designs on making the right cellular therapeutic, the more complexity we introduce and all of these discussions about automation and uh, engineering uh, these uh, solutions are pretty <coughs> premature. I feel like we should be concentrating on gathering information and learning. So how would you turn the paradigm? What solutions can you think of to be able to aggregate the data and look at it and learn from it? Turn it over to the panel. I mean, I've got my thoughts, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, we're all in the business of um, trying to defend some kind of control strategy. So that's why, I, I, yes, we, we can't just present learning. We have to, at some point, try and articulate control, which is very, very difficult in this space. Um, I, the, uh, obviously, your question, Karen, very good and sophisticated. Um, what, uh, my learning um, from Amgen um, was that when we created um, a data lake architecture there where we made or tried to make sure that we didn't have um, data uh, you know you know burrowed away <laughs> into little silos on people's individual laptops and that we created an architecture where um, data could be very readily accessed and pattern recognition um, um, and all kinds of tools for pattern recognition were initiated. Of course, you can generate garbage, um, but, but uh, I found that to be particularly effective in the process development and product understanding space. And so at Allogene, we, we started like in the first months of the company to set up our data architecture that way. And it's much more simple now because a lot of the um, IT capability to do that has been commoditized, so it can be done for much less cost. Um, so I think that I think that that is a good. That's very fundamental kind of thing uh, in answering your very sophisticated question, but it is to me a foundational component of if there's a pattern to be recognized and a relationship to be made or insight to be found, you have to start with those fundamentals. Yeah, maybe. Good, good question, Karen. Um, yeah, so it's about the control system, right? If you start with a control system, the process will follow. You're not, not the other way around, right? So it's, I think if we can emphasize more on the biological understanding, right, even in process tests, is going to give us a lot of insight you know, let's say you're differentiating cells, right? There's a lot of patterns that you have to recognize along the way to understand the biology of that differentiation, you know, let alone the final product. So you're, you're actually understanding the biology of how that cell is differentiated, or if you're understanding how you're editing a cell, right? What effect does it have on the cells themselves and, to, and on the metabolism, on the expression profile, and then you can design you can understand that, then you can figure out what's really important that you need to control. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's probably a good combination between collaboration almost, working very closely between your process person and your analytical person, right? Hand in hand to design your control system. If, if we can start with that, right, and, and put biology front and center of that discussion, I think we'll, we're gonna get somewhere. And, and what is good enough good enough, right? I mean, I guess that come back to the question, it's like we don't know the mechanism of action of a lot of <coughs> molecules that are used therapeutically, and this is just the next frontier of even less understanding of how they work. But if they work, and we can manufacture them at an appropriate cost of goods for that patient income. I'm just being provocative. I disagree with everything I'm saying, but. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, some, we just have Sorry. to keep moving forward because that's the only way we'll learn. There's no shortcut. One. Yeah. 
so when we ask what makes it work, we get into this very complicated web of things that we don't even know no. the reproducibility of what we're seeing. But when we see that it doesn't work, yeah. diving into those situations mm -hmm. is the foundation of the trust. And one of the differences today is, uh, you know, we've always tried to understand biology and, and exploit it, but one of the differences today is that we can engineer it. And so, you know, industrial, <laughs> industrialization uh, always, I'm an engineer, so it always goes through the pathway of engineers, right? Um, and so to make products of these, which we're going to have to do, um, you know, it is a little different than it was. Uh, we do need to, I, I totally agree with you, but we're in a, a little bit of a different area when we can actually manipulate the biology more yeah. than we've ever been able to do before. Right. And if that's you go not back 15 change. years yeah. and think what we can accomplish today compared to right. whatever we were back then, it's dramatic how much we've accomplished, but we've got a very long way to go. Um, I, I, my, my opinion is that um, if you're thinking about a control strategy and what you want to do within a process, keep it simple. You know, start, think about your starting point. I mean, you know, if you look at where we haven't got many systems that allow us to do much monitoring in real time within a system, so our ability to control is, is relatively limited. But, you know, you can, you can look at simple factors like glucose consumption and lactic acid production and think about how you control those because the biology of that is, is more understood. You know, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you get to 15 millimolar um, concentration of lactic acid for a T cell, it's going to slow down its proliferation. And therefore, you know, do you build a control strategy around that and create set points and think about how you drive that? But then on the flip of that, you've got the situation then where you're going from a, a manufacturing process where you're feeding based on set times to switching your feeding strategies based on information that's coming back from the system. And what does that then mean from, a, you know, from, from your you know, justifying that to a, to a regulatory body? Yeah. If, I, if I may just comment on maybe staff training a little bit, right? I think historically we've trained our engineers a certain way, our biology a certain way, right? And I think, I think we're at a juncture where we have to speak each other's language and, and really understand what, how do we work together as process and analytical people, right? And, and I think I'm seeing you know, grad schools are trying to do more of that, right? So our next generation of scientists, engineers coming in, they know something they know a lot more than data science and connectivity they, they get that right they grew up with the internet right i didn't um so how do we then train our next generation scientists and engineer to work in a kind of a new way right and whatever we want to call it 4.0 3.0 right that that's that's actually a very key um element that i see right in our workforce is is bring that connectivity together between between disciplines i you know absolutely see that that's a must for the field. Yeah, we're coming up very quickly on the end of, at the end of the session, so maybe I'll springboard off of that. That was a forward-looking, <coughs> what do you think needs to be accomplished in the next five or 10 years to get us even a step closer to what you were just highlighting. So Damon, wh what's next in the industry? Where, where's your attention? Um, so, so for me, it's the, it's the PAT technologies. I think you know, we need to think about how we get better sensor technologies, pre preferably uh, single-use disposable. Uh, we're seeing some of them coming through, technologies like 2D fluorescence that can do similar types of measurements to, to, to Raman, but could potentially be, be single-use and disposable, which would fit much more with our, the way that we're actually manufacturing our, our products. Um, I think if we can get those technology advances, then we can start to generate more data within our manufacturing processes and hopefully try and understand what's going on in there. Great. Michael? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I think that what's going to drive uh, things over the next few years is just the ability to engineer cells. I mean, I think, you know, we went from tissue engineering to the era of stem cells, and frankly, we're in the area of supercells now, uh, era of supercells, and I think that that's going to drive a lot of enablement. Great. Allison? I think I have to agree with Andy. Um, you know, Professor Phil Sharp said that the most challenging problems in the world looking forward would only be solved using convergent technologies, and I'm, I'm an I'm a absolute um, believer of, of that. And I, uh, I mean, I, I guess I agree with all my colleagues, um, <clears throat> but, um, but I think even if we had superior measurement technologies, 
um, you know, how we, how we use those to generate insights not only in manufacturing and product understanding, but in translational biology and clinical outcomes. It requires us to, um, as was already said, um, use each other's vocabulary for improving insights. So I think con convergent science is my answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. So I hope everybody, I, it's impossible to do justice to this topic in a one short hour, so I do appreciate everybody sticking around and, and hearing us out. Great questions. Sorry we didn't get to more questions. Um, love to thank our speakers um, for our panelists. So thanks very much. <clears throat> thank you guys. Have a